Amen. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. And uh, this one's going to be a fun one. I say that sarcastically. And the text reads like this. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and, and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I want to preach. Give me about 20 minutes and I'll be out your way. Let me preach my Sunday school lesson. I want to preach from these words, the difference between trials and temptations. The difference between trials and temptations. If you receive that word, say amen. <laughs> the difference between trials and temptations. Um, I haven't watched a lot of it, but um, I probably need to watch more of it. Um, but there is this show on Netflix. I don't know if you heard of it, but the, the name of the show, Sister Sonia, is called Is It Cake? I would, I would suggest you watch it. It's a phenomenal show. But long story short, people make cakes look impressively like real life objects. And so long story short, for example, the very pew that you are sitting in, someone will literally make a cake look like make a make a cake look like a pew is and it would be identical to the pew that you are sitting in and they've done it with everything they've done it with a cheeseburger they've done it with a water bottle a chair I mean and whatever it is they have taken the cake and made it look like a real life object and it can really fool anyone that the cakes turn out pretty good uh, in fact, it's actually been a trend for a while now. A lot of bakers are doing it. Uh, in this one particular situation, there was uh, um, the, uh, the, the, I forget her name, um, uh, but the star, the, the, the female that was the star in Precious. She was, uh, be, she was being interviewed by uh, Johnny Knoxville. And um, they said, we're, we're going to play a prank on her. And they were going to act like they were interviewing her. And he sat down in one chair and she sat down in another chair and she said, is this cake? And it was literally, I mean, it was, you saw it, it was literally, a, it looked like a suede chair, pillows and everything. I mean, the chair was literally bigger than this and the entire thing was made out of cake. And it was identical. When you get home, watch it. See, Pastor got good. I got, I got taste. But anyway, but it, but it was literally cake. And she sat into it. And to her surprise, she literally grabbed the chunk. And she said, not only is it cake, but it's good cake. Stay with me. I have a point. In James chapter 1, verse 13 through 15, James continues his letters to the Christian Jews in the diaspora to talk about temptations. Now, remember in previous verses, James was talking about how we need to see trials with joy at the front forefront of our minds. Y'all remember that we talked about trials so that we will be encouraged to know that God has allowed this trial to grow our faith. But now here we are in verse 13 and James starts talking about temptations. Now, somebody would ask, why would James talk, change the subject from trials to temptations? Why would James go from talking about God allowing trials, allowing our trials to increase our faith to talk about temptations that will decrease our faith from finding joy in our trials to talking about being lured into sin? Here's why. Because just like the celebrity mistaking cake to be real, to be a real chair, because they look so identical, sometimes we make the mistake of, of mistaking a trial for a temptation and vice versa. Because they look exactly the same, sometimes it will seem as if a trial and the temptation are one and the same because they happen at the same time. But James says, no, I'm drawing a line. James wants, us, wants to show us the difference between trials and temptations. Pastor, what's the difference between trials and temptations? Trials are circumstances that test our faith from the outside in. Temptations are sin-filled enticements from the inside out. All right, I'm going to teach a little bit. Can I teach a little bit? Let me teach my Sunday school lesson. I'll be out your way. Trials are circumstances that test our faith from the outside in. Temptations are sin-filled enticements from the inside out. However, the reason why we may get them confused is because they happen at the same time. Are you with me? Let me say it one more time. 
Trials are circumstances that test our faith from the outside in. Temptations are sin-filled enticements from the inside out. However, the reason why we get them confused is because they occur at the same time. The test and the trial occur at the same time. And watch this. And we think that because God has allowed the test and we are being tempted during the test that they must be one and the same. And James is saying, absolutely not. Trials and temptations are two totally separate different things. Now, why is it important that we know that? Here, there are, there are four reasons, actually. Four reasons why. No, number one, we need to, uh, uh, and it consists, of, uh, uh, it consists of why, when, who, and how. Why will we, why, uh, 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 we will mistake why they are happening. We will mistake uh, 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 when they are happening. We will mistake who is responsible and we will mistake how it is happening. Why, who, why, when, who, and how? Are you with me? You give me these four points, four or five, and I'm, and I'm out your way. Look at verse 13. Help me, Holy Spirit. Let no one say, let the church say when. When he is tempted. When he is tempted, watch me, not if by chance, not, 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 by, not by chance, not if, but it is when, when he is tempted. Now, before we get to the when, meaning it's going to happen, I want you to understand sometimes uh, 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 why it happens. What happens is temptations, if you will, or rather, let me say it this way, when you are going through a trial, you are going through a very difficult moment in your life. Are you hearing me? It's hard. And watch this. And the reason and when temptation happens, it happens during a trial. Here it is because we want the quickest way out. And so watch me. And so when trials come, how does it happen? Uh, I mean, excuse me, why does it happen? The reason why sometimes try, uh, temptations will happen is because trials are the try, the uncomfortableness, if you will, of the trial is pushing us to find the nearest exit to get out of this situation. Let me give it to you like this and you'll understand what I mean. Um, y'all been to Walmart and you go to Walmart, and some of y'all do it. I see it on your faces. I know. I know what I'm saying when I say it. You go to Walmart, and each and, and each side has an entrance and an exit. Look at y'all smirking because y'all know. And you're supposed to go out the exit door when you're exiting. Look at y'all. Let tell the truth and, and shame the devil. You're supposed to go out the exit, out the exit door, and enter in the enter door. Now, you're trying to leave out of the exit door, but let somebody decide they want to look at their receipt in front of the exit door. What do you do? You go out the enter door. Now, why do you go? You ain't supposed to go out that door. You're supposed to go out the exit door. But watch this. But because you want the quickest way out, you'll go out the enter What's my point? Watch this. Temptations happen. Why temptations happen in trials is because we are looking for the quickest exit, not the godly exit. I'm a teacher in here. Give me grace, God. Are you hearing me? We, we want the quickest exit, not a godly exit. The quickest exit means I'm leaving on my terms when I want to, and I'm trying to get out of this and be done with it as quickly as possible. But if I'm doing it God's way, I'm going to leave when God says leave. Are you hearing me in here? So why do temptations happen during trials? We're looking for the quickest exit. But when do trials happen? Now, here's where I need you to break. Now, I need to break this thing down. He says when trials happen. Pastor, when do trials happen? Are you ready? All the time. Where trials happen in seasons, temptations happen literally all the time. Right now, you could be falling into temptation all the time. Now, Pastor, why does why do temptations happen all the time? Can I take it back a little bit? I got to go back before I go forward. I'm almost done. According to Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says we were dead in our sins, right? Sin reigned in our lives. Let the church say reigned. When we did not know Christ, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us sin reigned in our lives. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, that, uh, that sin broke out into all of humanity, and we all have what is known as a sin nature. In other words, sin before Christ was always at the forefront of our mind. Sin was what we thought. Sin was our reason. Sin is how we live, move, and have our being. 
Sin reigned in our lives. But when Jesus came into our lives, but God saved us by grace, the Holy Spirit moved in, told, the, told sin, you can't live here and be reigning anymore. And now the Holy Spirit reigns in our lives. Are you hearing me? The Holy Spirit leads us. Christ is our first thought. Christ is the reason we live and move and have our being. We are servants of Christ. The Holy Spirit now reigns. Now watch this. Let me put it to you this way. You ever seen a horrible restaurant, right? You used to like it, but it's nasty, right? The, re- the customer service is horrible. The food is bad, and it just looked nasty when you walk in. And then when you see something that says it's closed, you got good riddance. Y'all should have been closed. But then it comes back. The doors are open again. The food is better. The customer service is better, and everything looks great. Usually, what sign do you see on the outside? Under new management. It's the same with us. Now that the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are under new management. Now watch me, stay with me, but here's where, here's, here's, uh, here's the problem. This is why temptations happen all the time, because though Holy Spirit is, is, if you will, the new manager, sin is still in the kitchen. Holy Spirit reigns, but sin still has residence. He's still living down here. Watch me. And at any given moment, sin is trying to look for an opportunity to reign again. At any given moment, sin is trying to usurp the manager and try and take over and try and have you live in your old life. Am I making sense? So your sinful nature, this is why James says when temptations come, because he's not just talking about during the trial, but he says at any given moment, if I can, your sinful nature will find an opportunity to usurp the Holy Spirit, he will or it will. Are you hearing me? Galatians 5.17 says it this way, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Uh, for those for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Let me explain something to you, church. What you don't realize and what I need you to realize is that as you are living this, this Christian life, you have a war going on on the inside of you. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. What's the war, pastor? Your flesh versus your spirit. And every day, your flesh is trying to win. And the Holy Spirit already reigns. But if you give opportunity to your flesh, your Holy, the Holy Spirit will be grieved. Every day is a fight, for te- is a fight against temptation. Every day. There is, you get no days off. You get days off of work. You get comp time. You get all that good stuff. But when it comes to fighting your flesh, no, you don't get a day off. Whether you're tired or not, it does not matter how you feel. Your flesh says, I'm ready. Whenever you sit down, I will stand up. This is not going to be a shouting sermon, by the way. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's when. So we understand why it happens during trials. We understand when it happens. But then we have to ask the question, who is responsible? James says, well, before I tell you who it is, I tell you who it's not. He said, it ain't God. Look at verse 13. I am being, he said, let no one say when he is being tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Remember, trials and temptations can and will happen at the same time. And because it happens at the same time, we think, watch this, because it happens at the same time, we think God is tempting us. Because God has allowed the trial and we are tempted during the trial, we think God is the one who has sent the temptation. That's not true. It's not true. James clearly says, no one, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. Let me just cut to the chase. God is not to blame for our temptations. Let me say it again. God is not to blame for our temptations. And unfortunately, let me break just a quick, just to give a quick history lesson. We've been, we've been blaming God for our temptation for years. We've been doing it really since the beginning of time. How do you know, Pastor? Well, when you go to Genesis chapter 3, when Adam got finished eating the fruit from his, from his wife Eve, God came walking in the cool another day, Mother Curry, and he said, Adam, where are you? And he didn't say, where are you, because he didn't know where he was. He just wanted to know, I know you're hiding. And Adam said, I was naked and afraid. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the fruit that I told you not to? And then Adam, of course, now that he got caught out, he said, I ate the fruit because of the wife you gave me. Since the beginning of time, we've pointed at God and said, it's your fault the way that I am. 
Since the beginning of time, you, you know what we say stuff like, God made me this way. That's why I, I am the way that I am. That's why I sin. We, we say, if God gave me more money, then I wouldn't have to do it illegally. Y'all not going to talk to me. If, if, if God gave me my relationship, I wouldn't have to compromise. Come on in here. Since the beginning of time, we've been blaming God. But God says no. James says no. God is not to blame for two reasons. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Pastor, what does that mean that God cannot be tempted with evil? It is very simple, and I'm going to make this very simple. I, I, like to make, I like to make this as plain as possible. I want a two-year-old to understand it. God does not desire sin in any way, shape, or form. Sin is not, he doesn't desire it, and sin is nowhere in his nature. For, for, for God to sin would be against everything that he is. For, for God, uh, th- this is why, watch me, we just got finished singing it. This is why we say, the Lord is good. Watch me. When we say the Lord is good, we are not just talking about our experience. It is literally a fact. God is good. He is the epitome of good. There is no flaw, no sin in him. In fact, he's so good, he hates sin. I like how uh, Pastor David Platt says it. David Platt says it like this, that God is aware of sin, but he, he is not tainted by it. God is good. Let the church say God is good. It is literally his nature that God wants nothing to do with evil. Watch this. So if God cannot be tempted with evil, meaning he wants nothing to do with it, why would he want you to do evil? He himself tempts no one. Why would God tempt you to do something that he hates? Can I go deeper with this? It it, it literally goes against scripture. The Bible says that God loves you with a steadfast love. If he loves you, why would he try and force you to do something that you hate, that he hates? Let me give you another example. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He sent Jesus to step out of heaven, walk on the earth to die for you so that he can remove the remission of sin. Why would God send Jesus to die for you to remove the remission of sin only for you to be tempted to go into sin again? Are you hearing what I'm saying? God does not want you to sin. God says, I want you to be holy as I am holy. God says, I want you. I, I don't want, uh, God is not tempting us, tempting our faith, uh, uh, tempting our faith, but God tests our faith to increase it. So if God is not the reason why we fall into sin, if y'all quiet now, I guess I'm going to preach by myself. Because here's the hard part. Because if God is not the one responsible, then who's responsible? I, uh, I bring in the prophet Michael Jackson. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. We are responsible. Can you say that with me? Just say we are. We are responsible. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Let the church say own desire. Our desire God is not to blame for our temptation. We are. Now, let me explain how it's our fault. That word desire, here, here's, I got to break this down now. How it happens, how it happens, and, 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 and I'm going to give you some encouragement, and then I'm done. That, that word desire, uh, uh, it, that desire, hear, hear me when I say this very carefully, and watch it again at home if, if you're very awake now. <laughs> desire in and of itself is not a sin. Okay, here, stay with me. Stay with me. This is very important. Desire in and of itself is not a sin, but it is when we fulfill that desire in ungodly ways that makes it a sin. Okay? When you are hungry, what do you do? You go eat. That is a God-given desire. You are allowed, If you're hungry, go eat. I suggest you go to Raisin Cane's, South Jersey. You're welcome. If you don't like raising canes, go to Freddy's across the street. You're welcome. Uh, I like to eat. Uh, uh, hungry, you go and eat. Amen? That's a natural God-given desire. However, when you become a glutton and you just eating just because you can, that's a sin. Are you, ca- you have taken a godly, natural desire and you, have, and you have fulfilled it in ungodly ways. Watch me. In, an, in, another, in another two to two hours, I'm going to take a nap. Why? I'm tired. Right. 
It is a natural, it is a natural God-given, a God-given desire to recuperate and to sleep. But when you're lazy, that's a sin. Y'all quiet before. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come this way and you're not going to like it. Are you ready? Sex is a God-given desire that God created for the covenant of marriage. And God says, it's good. But when you do it outside of marriage, oh boy, uh-huh. You are attempting to fulfill a God-given desire in an ungodly way. Does that make sense? Fill in the blank. So temptation is when we see an opportunity to take a natural God-given desire and to attempt to fulfill it in an ungodly way. Does that make, if, you, if it makes sense, say amen. The picture being painted here in the text is of a fish falling for the bait. That word Lord actually means to, to set or, or trap or to set a trap or drop a bait. That phrase to draw away it, it, it actually means, uh, it actually uh, is what it sounds like. It means you are being carried away by the trap. When the Bible says you are lured or drawn away by desires, watch this. It means we have seen an opportunity, that's the babe, to fulfill our desires to be drawn away in an ungodly way. Watch me. And we are attempting to take it. We are looking for the ungodly way and we want it. Does that make sense? We are baited when we see an unnatural, ungodly way to fulfill our God-given desires. Uh, y'all know I worked at a school, and a couple years back, I think, matter of fact, it was probably, it was probably before COVID, uh, uh, I used to talk every morning with, with my brother. He goes by the name of Mr. Mike Polifka. Mike Polifka. He, he was a, he was a cat, I, I don't know, a Catholic Baptist, a Catholic or whatever you want to call him. But he believed in Jesus as his Savior, but he, my man was at the Mass. But he'll tell you, Jesus is my Savior. I confess it with my mouth, believe in my heart, but he going to do them Hail Marys. It was very interesting. But he'll tell you, no, Pastor, he'll tell me, Christian, I believe in Jesus. Jesus saved my soul. He said, but I'm going to Mass. That's what he did. Hey, it worked. But anyway, but, I re- but he talked, we talked about three things <laughs> every morning. And when I say, Mr. Mike, if you're watching this, I love you. Every morning we talked about three things, politics, God, and fishing. Every morning. Every morning. Are you are you here what I'm sure I say every morning? But but sometimes there, but but during this time, there was this one time we're getting to the Christmas season. So I wanted to get him something for Christmas because that's my man. And I said, uh, I said, uh, Mr. P, you know, I'm trying to fish. Uh, <laughs> go figure. But I'm trying to fish. What What is he like? You know, what do you need for Christmas? Will be a good thing to get. So I'm like, maybe fishing will be it. So I said, hey, man, what do you need? What do you think? Uh, what do you what do you need for fishing? And he said, oh, man, I can always use some bait. I said, fantastic. So I, I, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I mean, just any bait. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. Not just any bait. I'm like, what do you mean? He said, no, 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 no. Certain bait catch certain fish. Preach, Mr. P. What, what is he saying? God, 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 watch me. God does not tempt us into sin. We tempt our own selves because we fall for our own bait. We look for the bait. And then when we look for the bait, we grab at the bait. No one is to blame but our own sinful nature looking for the bait. That's why God does not tempt us. We, we fall into our own trap. I'm done now. Thank you for listening. But now we have to explore. Let's look at it practically. How we fall into sin. I want you to look at verse 14 and 15. I like how R. Ken Hughes says it. We, we understand the source of temptation, but now I want you to pay attention to this because this is very important. Because now we're going to find the course of temptation. The, the steps that take place, and then I'm out your way. If you can get these, these, this next line, I want you to keep this in your heart. Uh, keep this as a battle plan when temptation comes. Look at verse 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is Lord and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. All right. Now, verse 14 and 15 combined with verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14. uh, Verse 14 is about fishing. It's fishing imagery. But verse 15 is where it changes from fishing to childbirth. It's kind of weird, but but scholars call it the cycle of death. Or I'd like to call it the cycle of sin. And, and, and there are steps to this. What's the first step, Pastor? Step one, enticement. I believe this is the most important step to fighting temptation. Why so, Pastor? Because enticement is the bait. 
right? This is the idea set before us. This is the initial start to temptation. This is the thought that pops up in our mind. This is the enticement. This is the bait. But there's one thing I failed to mention about this bait. See, see, we're baited, but there's one thing we forgot about. I forgot about the hook. You can't have bait without a hook. Are you with me? When you are fishing, you don't just put down a hook to catch a fish. No, you got to put bait on the hook. Watch this. With enticement comes deception. All right. Watch this. With enticement comes deception. When we entertain the enticement, when we begin to entertain our sin-filled thoughts and desires, when we begin to consider the opportunity to sin, watch this. We're starting to believe the lie. Okay. You're starting, when you entertain that thought that comes in your mind, that opportunity to fall into sin, when you entertain it, that means you're starting to believe the lie that this is okay. You're starting to believe the lie that this isn't a sin. You're starting to believe a lie that this won't hurt anyone. Why? Because you are, you are looking at it, you are thinking about it, and you are deceiving yourself all within the process. Give me an example, Pastor. You remember when Adam, when Adam before, um, excuse me, when Eve was in the Garden of Eden, before she ate the fruit, what was the question the serpent asked her? Did God really say that you would die after you ate the fruit? It, you start to believe the lie. You start to believe that you deserve this. When you entertain the enticement, you are believing the lie. Enticement comes with deception. But watch this. But the more you think about it, the more you believe the lie. And then after you enticement, step two, you're drawn away. To be drawn away, watch this, it means not only are you, not only have you thought about, not only have you looked at the idea and you're actually considering it. No, 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 you're, you're, you're living it. You're thinking it over and over now. You're mulling, it, mulling over it in your mind. You see, I want you to understand, temptation doesn't just happen out of nowhere. And you just fall into it. It is not the all of a sudden pop. It's the slow leak. Watch this. Are you ready? You said yes a couple times before you got to the big yes. Come on. All right. I knew. It's all right. I already knew that. I already knew what kind of sermon this is going to be. It's all right. Just take it in. We'll be all right. It, 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 it's, it's not the blowout. It's the slow leak. It's the fact that to be drawn away, it means that slowly but surely it is going over in your mind over and over again. Over and over and over. You don't stop it from happening. You just let it go over and over and over and over again. There was a movie that, uh, that me and my brother thought, thought was far too long, but the movie was called Focus. It, it starred Will Smith and Margot Robbie. Good movie, kind of long. But anyway, good movie. We watched it. And long story short, uh, um, Will Smith plays a con man who essentially just bets people random crazy bets, and he gets a whole lot of money for it. But he sets up a plan to make sure that he wins every time. And so in this particular moment... In the, in the movie, he's betting, that he's playing craps with this guy and he loses all his money. And he says, listen, I bet you double or nothing. He says, double another big wheel. And he says, uh, he says uh, double or nothing. If I win, you give me double of what, you give me double what I owe you. He said, but if you, uh, if, if I win, I get, you give me double what I owe you. He said, but if you win, I pay you double of what I owe you. Right? I'm sorry if he, <laughs> He says, if I win, I, you give me double of what I owe you. I said it right. And he said, if you win, you give me double. Uh, you gi I give you double. Amen? Everybody with me? Sorry, one of y'all looked confused, and I said, did I say it wrong? So I had to go back and say it again. So here's what happens. So then what ends up happening is he said, here's the bet. He said, at the time they're watching a the football game, he said, pick any number of any person on that football team, and if I guess it, I get all the money. He said, ain't no way you're going to win it. He says, write it on this sheet of paper, turn it over. He says, okay, sure enough, he writes it on a piece of paper, he turns it over, and he guesses the number. And he says, how did you guess the number? And he says, hey, man, you know, luck of the draw, whatever the case may be. Margot Robbie's character goes to Will Smith's character. She said, how did you do it? He said, here's how I did it. He said, we've been pl implanting the number in his head for weeks. He said his he said his hotel room was the same number. His uh, 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 the, in billboards we bought billboards that had the number in his face. Wherever he went, his hotel room, his parking spot, his parking meter, wherever he went, he saw the same number over and over again. Which is why it's no surprise that he picked the number because it was always in his face. 
Come here. It's the same with temptation. When it is always in your mind, no wonder you end up falling for it. Why? Because you're mulling it over. You are thinking about it. It's always in your head. And that's how you fall into temptation, which brings us to the next point. When you're drawn away, eventually the Bible says you conceive. Then desire when it has conceived. What does it mean to conceive? It means you finally do it. Deception, watch this. When you entertain the lie, eventually you will believe the lie. Let me say it again. When you entertain the lie, eventually you will believe the lie. When, when, watch this. When you believe the lie, you will live out the lie. Deception always brings about disobedience. Deception always brings about disobedience. Watch this. So you can, we cannot say, I'm, all right, I'm going to get in real trouble now. We cannot say, as long as it's in my mind, I'm not hurting nobody. Uh, we cannot say, as long as, as, long as it's, I'm keeping it to me, no one's going to get hurt. No, my friend, because eventually what's in your mind will eventually be in your hands. As a man thinks, he is. Eventually, though you say you're safe in your mind, you are not safe in your mind. That's the devil. And now that's you lying to yourself and saying, as long as I'm here, I'm straight. No, because eventually what's in your head will eventually be in your hands. And after we've done it, the Bible says, I'm done now. It brings forth what? Death. Pastor, what's death? Now, death doesn't necessarily mean eternal separation from God. Uh, 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 it, James is not talking about eternal separation from God, but, but James is saying that there will be disruption in your fellowship with God. Let the church say disruption. What does that look like? Let me tell you what it looks like. It means you lose your peace, man. It, it, it means you quench the Holy Spirit. You carry some shame. And depending on how long you've been, you, how long it takes for you to repent, you start to get spiritually blind. You get numb to the Holy Spirit's prompting. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh, let, me, let me just throw this in here. There is very dangerous to be in sin and to stay in sin for a long period of time because you begin to numb your senses. You begin to quiet the Holy Spirit too easily. I know y'all don't have to say amen, but I know I'm preaching right. You, be, you, be, you, begin, to, you begin to justify why you're doing the wrong thing. Your mindset begins to change, but, but, but ultimately you disrupt your fellowship with God. Pastor, what does it mean to disrupt my fellowship with God? Uh, uh, let me put it to you this way. It, it, it simply means that, that you don't feel, you don't feel the, God feels distant because of your sin. Now, let me make that clear because that sounds a little harsh. Let me say it to you this way. Have you ever had a friend that has a terrible habit and you want them to get rid of that habit, but they won't get rid of that habit? And so the truth of the matter is you go, okay, I have two choices. If I stay here, then that means that I'm condoning the habit. But if I walk away as much as it hurts, you'll realize I'm serious about you being done with that habit. It's the same with God. God says, I love you too much to continue to give me, give me, give you my presence and you continue to stay in your sin. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I am not saying, God, watch me, God is not pulling himself back, if you will, to condemn you. No, God is saying, I need you to make a turnaround. Are you hearing me? When you, whenever you read, get a chance, you read Psalm 32, I believe it is, where, where David talks about how uh, after his sin with Bathsheba, he said there was a turmoil in his soul. But that turmoil in his soul wasn't God punishing him. It was God saying, you and I are not in fellowship right now, and I need you to turn around. And God says, the reason why I do that is because I need you to get back to me. I'm not punishing you. I'm trying to give you an all clear signal to repent and return back to me. Death means a, a, a disruption of the fellowship. And if I can be honest with you, you need God too much to disrupt your fellowship with him. You, you need God too much. I'll, maybe, you know, what? I won't talk about you. I'll talk about me. I need God too much. There's too much going on in our lives for us to continue in sin. I'm sorry. There ain't a day that goes by in your life where you don't need to pray and you're going to continue in your sin. You better not turn around and repent as quickly as possible. Why? We need him too much. 
I don't, I don't, we, we don't have time to not get a prayer through because I got to repent. No, let me go. I'll cut to the chase. I got too much stuff going on in my life to not repent to God. Are you hearing me? So it's not a punishment, but it's not a punishment for sin. It's a call back to righteousness. I'm done. Here's my final point. Let me give you some encouragement and I'm out your way. Um, First thing, and then I want to give you encouragement, and then I want to give you four applications, small things that can help you in your fight against temptation. Do I have two minutes? Two. Somebody said, you lying, Pastor. All right, five, five. I meant five. Watch this. Let me, let me encourage some of you, because some of you may be thinking, Pastor, I've, I've given my life to Christ, and I'm, and I'm tempted, and I'm still tempted with the same temptation over and over again. Pastor, is my fellowship messed up with Christ? No, it is not. Temptation does not mean that you are apart from Christ. Watch this. What, what, and temptation is not, a, a, is not a gauge of how you're walking with Christ. It is when you submit to temptation that gauges it. What does that mean? I already said it when we go back to when. You are going to be tempted. But watch me. But as you are tempted, it is what you do with the temptation. How will you respond? If you respond with no, then you are growing in Christ. When you respond with no with temptation, it means that I am telling my flesh you are going to die today. But when I but when I say yes to temptation, it means you are letting your sin reign in, in the Holy Spirit's place. Am I making sense? So why, let me let me put it to you this way. Uh, uh, um, um, you will never be sinless. That's not till Jesus comes. But as you walk in Christ, you should be sinning less. Am I making sense? Let me say it again. You will never be sinless, but you should be sinning less. Meaning, the more that you walk with Christ, you should be sinning less. When temptation comes, it's going to come off strong at first. But as you continue to say no, that, strong, that stronghold should be coming down slowly. Let me, let me put it to you this way. Let me say it very simple. It ain't hard. If you feed it, it will grow. If you starve it, it will wither. Amen, somebody. If you feed it, it will grow. If you starve it, it will wither. The more you, the more you, star, the more you starve it, the more it will wither. We all got temptations in here in one way, shape, or form, pastor included. And, we ha- and I have learned in my own, and I've, I have learned even with my own life, I've looked and I said, mm, that temptation ain't as strong anymore. Why? Because as slowly but surely, it has withered. It has withered. It has withered. Why? Because you keep saying no. Now, pastor, give me some combat. I need some, I need some CQC. I need you to show me, get, show me how to fight this thing. Here it is. Number one, Paul says it this way, capture every thought. Too many of us are, uh, help me, Holy Spirit. We, we so spirit-filled that we don't, we don't take control of our mind. The Bible says, what does it say? Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. You got a changed heart. You still got the same mind. Why is it that we, we can't, don't be so spirit filled that you forget that use your mind. You have to capture every thought that comes in your mind. Paul says, take captive every thought that, and, and bring it to the obedience of Christ. If, that, if there was a thought that enters your mind and you know it doesn't need to be there, you need to say, no, you can't stay here today. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to get in trouble now. Too many of us got thoughts that we just let just run around the house. <laughs> Come on. Come on, and watch me. And it's not just, and it's not just like uh, temptations of, of lust or anything like that. Sometimes, are you ready? Sometimes it's, it's fears. It's anxieties. Y'all not talking to me. I know I'm preaching in here. You, there, there are a whole lot of thoughts that y'all just let, we just, we just let run through our minds. And then all of a sudden we're trying to figure out why we're coming into work like this. Because you've been dwelling on it for a week. Listen, go see the therapist. Absolutely. I believe it. You need God and therapy. God can work through the therapist. But let me ask you this. When was the last time you disciplined your mind? When was the last time you said, I know I'm afraid, but why am I afraid? No, no. God is not giving me a spirit of fear. Let me cast that down now. I know I'm anxious, but why am I anxious? God says, don't be anxious for anything. Are you hearing me in here? You need to take captive every thought and say, you can't stay here today. Are you hearing me? That's number one. Number two, remember the hook and the bait. Remember, listen, we've all fallen into temptation, and we all know what we felt after we fell into the temptation. Remember the hook. You remember where you were and how you felt. Do you want to do that again? Simple as that. Play back the tape. 
remember the hook. Remember that this bait is a lie. You need to keep that in the forefront of your mind. I know what you feel, but you need to remember. There goes that mind again. Remember what, what that hook is. Remember it's a lie. Let the church say it's a lie. Remember the hook. Now here's another one. Now this one is very practical. Wait, are you ready? Resist the devil and run. Pass the run? Yes. Resist the devil and run. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee. That means you are, you're saying, no, I am not going to do that. But the problem that a lot of us have is that we resist the devil and we stay. Let me give you a perfect example, uh, give me a biblical example and then an example after that. There is a name, man that goes by the name of Joseph. He's one of my favorites in the Bible. My man, my man did temptation right. When temptation came there, he was uh, a slave for Potiphar's wife, a uh, slave for Potiphar. Potiphar's wife wanted to be with him. He said, absolutely not, ma'am. No, thank you. Well, after so many advances that she caught him in a room by himself, she said, she said, lay with me. He took off his jacket and ran out of the room. Which lets me know, brothers, that she might, might, must not have been hard on the eyes. Because if, if he stayed there, clearly it wasn't a temptation. So clearly she must have, looked like, must have looked pretty good. And what did he do? Watch me. Some of us are in the soda aisle at the store. Lord, I don't want to take this soda. Lord, please don't take this soda. But you stay in the aisle. I'm try, I lo- I, it's a joke, but Seriously. If you know you're at a place where temptation is not good for you, leave. Some of us are so spiritual. I pray by the, I rebuke you in the name of, get out the aisle. Look at your neighbor and say, get out the aisle. Just get out the aisle. You over here in the name of Jesus. You done got oil in the aisle. You done poured it on your head. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Get out the aisle. You're doing too much. Watch me, watch me. We are too, we, we got so much heart, but we ain't got no head, y'all. Get out the aisle. Run. If you are in a place around a person, whatever the case may be, run. I'm leaving. Bye. Simple as that. I'm done. Oh, I'm done. Well, one more thing, and I'm, I'm sitting. Ready? Because the truth of the matter is, as we grow in Christ, um, you're, 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 as you grow, you're going to fall. Temptations are going to come, and sometimes you'll fall for it. But, but I want you to hear me, hear me, and I pray that this touches you right where you are. The Lord is faithful. First John, uh, First John 1 and 9 says, for if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Pastor, what does that mean? For those of you that came, in your mind, came here and you said, man, Pastor, I sinned, I messed up, I fell. Let me tell you something. There's grace for you today. There's grace for you today. You, you, you can get back up again. Um, there was this little girl, uh, this is about a year ago. This little girl, I think she's in, great, she's in third grade now. And um, she was outside playing with the kids or whatever. And, I mean, when she tripped, she tripped bad. I mean, it was, it was like a face plant. And I said, Lord, Jesus. And, but what was funny was she got right back up. I said, I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah. She goes, I'm fine. I said, she said, but did you see how I got up? <laughs> You're laughing, but I pray that this ministers to your soul. Get up again. God is faithful. God will forgive you. There's grace for you. God says, I've already covered your sin by the blood. Get up again. Let me talk to some of you. Stop beating yourself up over the temptation that you did years ago. God says, I already put that on the cross. Get back up. Stop over here beating yourself. There is now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. Get back up. Too many of us just stay down and we say, I deserve to feel this way. No, you don't. Get back up. Why? Because God, by his grace, has forgiven you of those sins and he has cleansed you of all unrighteousness. God says, I no longer see you. I'm no longer, I'm, I'm no longer where you are. You're stuck here. God says, I'm already at forgiveness. You're still at condemnation, even though I forgave you for that already. God says, I need you to go to the next room because I'm waiting for you. Let it go. You're forgiven and get back up again. There's trials and there's temptations. Trials happen. Temptations happen during trials because we're looking for a way out. 
And when, and when temptations come, yeah, it's going to happen because of our sin-filled nature. You are going to be drawn, you're going to be enticed. Don't fall for the enticement. Don't fall for being drawn away. And even if you get down to death and you disrupt that fellowship, turn back to Christ and repent. And say, God, I did it. I'm not even, it's my fault. I'm not even going to try and blame nobody else. It was me. And let God wash you again. Amen. We want to invite you. We want to invite you to know Christ as your Savior. A couple of things that we need to do here is simple is that uh, you need, we need to confess our sins. Uh, uh, confess and say, Lord, I have sin in my life. And I need that sin removed. And the only way that that sin can be removed is when we confess that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and he was resurrected and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So you simply just need to say, Lord, I have sins. Forgive me for those sins. I receive you as Savior, and I believe by faith that you are Lord and that you are the Lord of my life and you have redeemed me from my sins. And just like that, you have salvation. Just like that, you know the Lord for yourself. Uh, one thing that we've learned, uh, and, and we know at Union here at our church, uh, uh, we would uh, uh, we would love for you to be a part of our church. But at the same time, um, if you wish to go to another church or you want uh, uh, know someone else, that's fine too. But one thing is certain, and, and, uh, you don't have to be here to be saved. Uh, you know the Lord for yourself. So uh, if you have any uh, questions or concerns, I would uh, advise you to go to our email. Uh, our email is unionbaptist.south southriverNJ at gmail.com. That's unionbaptist.southriverNJ at gmail.com.